So let's give uh, Megan a big round of applause and welcome. <laughs> thanks, Brad. Um, and thanks to you guys for coming out. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in Portland, so I'm loving it. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, by way of introduction, I actually want to kick things off by telling you a little bit about my background. So before somebody told me that you could actually make a career from just kind of messing around in Photoshop, I actually spent a lot of years working in the service industry. Um, my first job was a drive through attendant at McDonald's. Has anyone else ever worked at McDonald's? Any other veterans out there? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Consider yourselves lucky, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was a, a drive through attendant at a McDonald's, a cashier at this weird gift shop slash bar slash restaurant in my hometown. Uh, and that's a real picture of what it looks like. Uh, I was a waitress at this very kind of ridiculous pizza joint um, and a hotel receptionist at this hotel. These are all pictures from where I really worked except for McDonald's. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, at the time, I really just kind of viewed these jobs as a painful but necessary way to pay the bills until I figured out what my true calling was. I was one of those college students that changed majors like seven times. Um, <laughs> and I've come to realize now, the, the more time I spend as, in design, that these jobs actually taught me a lot of valuable lessons that I've been able to apply to my work as an experienced designer. Uh, sort of central to that is that my training in each of these service in industry jobs really sort of revolved around one theme, which was viewed as the key to our success in whatever it was that we were doing. Um, we wanted to become sort of a beloved local business within our community that had very loyal, repeating customers uh, who advocated for us. And if you think about like what it means to be a business that's beloved by your community, these are the kind of places that really just have a very special place in your heart. I actually have one of my own. Um, it's a very small place in my hometown in Florida. Uh, it's called Doug and Lil's Potato Patch. <laughs> and whenever I go home, I insist on going to this tiny sort of crappy diner. The food is okay, uh, but it's mainly because everybody there is just very kind and welcoming and excited to see you when you come in. And it has this sort of familiar warmth that gives me that feeling of belonging. So even though I left my hometown almost 10 years ago, I'm a lifelong fan. And whenever I go home to visit family, I, I bring my friends if they're with me or I insist that we go back. And it's not because, like I said, that it's necessarily the best. It's just the way it feels when I'm there. I feel like I belong. And in every service industry job that I've worked, we were trying to create, admittedly with very varying degrees of success, that sort of potato patch feeling. We wanted to create passionate, lifelong fans who would advocate for us and keep coming back. And you know, so when you think about how you get those types of customers, it's really all about showing them that they are welcome, supported, and valued. So our thinking was, people will return if we make them feel welcome and happy to be there. But the problem with creating those types of loyal customers and the difficult thing about working in service in general is that creating those types of relationships as an employee takes a lot of patience and persi persistence and willingness to tolerate a lot of very annoying people. <laughs> Customers often completely would lose their cool or behave in really unexpected, seemingly unreasonable ways, or our services would fail, or other employees would make mistakes that I got blamed for, or sometimes I was just tired and I'd burn my hand on the fry machine, so I made the mistake. Um, <laughs> and this is kind of the beauty of software and, and the appeal of working in design, and really the reason why online tools have replaced so many brick and mortar businesses. Interfaces are very consistent, they're streamlined, they're efficient. You know, they don't make mistakes or behave in unpredictable ways. And I think this is why most of us would rather be designers than deal with people face to face. We like not having to confront all that complicated human messiness directly. And I actually think for the most part, that's a good thing that technology makes everything so much more streamlined and predictable. I certainly enjoy using food delivery apps like Seamless rather than you know, trying to find reviews of a restaurant and call them and describe my address to them. So 
I, the only problem with this, I think, is that sometimes software goes too far in stripping the humanity out of the experience. We can make interfaces that are predictable and efficient, but they can also be very mundane and joyless and sometimes forgettable. So sometimes what we lose sight of in the name of streamlining is that really at the end of the day, the goal for our online businesses is the same as it was in those traditional service industry businesses. We want to create customers who feel like they're part of something. They want to feel welcomed, they want to feel appreciated, and we want them to become loyal advocates. So the way we go about that is showing them that they are welcome, supported, and valued. UC Pisanen, who is a UX strategist, created this brilliant graphic for how we should be thinking about our product launches on the web. Typically, product teams are sort of driven to get out an MVP, a minimum viable product, and oftentimes that's thought of, of as just what is at the most basic functional. And then if there's time, we try to make it reliable, and then we try to make it usable, and maybe if we have enough budget, we think about the emotional design component, and making it enjoyable. So Pisanen argues, and I would agree, that instead there should be an element of each of these in our process. Um, even if it means limiting a release's functionality, it should always include an element of reliability, usability, and not least of all, emotional design. Some really big name companies are actually starting to adopt this approach. Uh, for example, I love this quote that's from the recently released IBM Style Guide. We must be more than user-centered. We must be human-centered. To know people first as people, not as users or customers or clients. Our designs are conceived from a deep understanding of humanity and with the desire to help individuals accomplish their goals. If you guys haven't seen the IBM Style Guide yet, definitely go check it out. Um, it's beautiful and very well done and full of kind of little bits of wisdom like this. So that's something that I want to talk about and tackle, at least in part today. Um, how do we go about sort of conveying that deep understanding of humanity through our designs? And how do we show people just via a website that they are welcome, supported, and valued? There's a million ways to achieve this goal, um, but for this talk, I want to really focus on three. And at the end of this, my hope is that you'll have some ideas for how to make your web service feel more like an offline service and you know, less like a faceless tool and more like a beloved local business that's made by people and for people. So to start, I want to talk about what it means to have sort of a welcoming personality as an online business. And maybe you think describing an interface as having a personality is a bit much. After all, for the most part, it's like forms are forms, buttons are buttons. Some might look better than others, but do they really make us actually feel different? And uh, do they really communicate personality traits? So in his important book, uh, Emotional Design, Why We Love or Hate Everyday Things, Donald Norman tells us that everything has a personality. Everything sends an emotional signal. Norman goes on to point out that people will infer personalities and experience emotions even when the designer never intended for them to. And horrible personalities can actually instill horrid emotional states in the users. So in a bit, I'm gonna share some examples of different personalities on the web that will hopefully kind of demonstrate this more clearly. But first I want us to really just consider what is it that makes a product either welcoming and friendly or as Norman puts it, accidentally horrible. Um, and in order to understand what sort of personalities our designs might be projecting, we have to first understand like what constitutes a personality when it comes to design. So in another great book on emotional design titled Appropriately Design for Emotion, the authors explain that interfaces, just like people, can be perceived as having either a dominant and sort of aggressive personality or a friendly one. And so the question is, how do we know if we're conveying dominance versus friendliness through our designs? There's actually certain visual style choices that people make um, that can really contribute to people's impressions of how dominant or friendly a company is. And a lot of these will probably seem very intuitive to you. But an interface that is very angular, heavy, high contrast, and dense is going to be perceived as more dominant or aggressive, 
On the other end, uh, an interface that has lots of curves, light, low contrast, and white space will feel much more friendly and welcoming. Occasionally, a dominant style is actually intended and beneficial, such as when the customers who are consuming the product also have kind of dominant personalities typically, and they want to identify with the company as feeling powerful and tough and full of authority. So a good example of that uh, comes with the Mac Trek site. I think when we look at this, we can agree that it conveys a lot of dominance. It has you know, high contrast colors, sharp angles, uh, bold fonts, they're all uppercase. But in this case, it's kind of appropriate. It makes sense for their brand and for their customers. But we've also seen how moving from a very dominant style to a more friendly one can be transformative. And a classic example of this comes from personal computing. Uh, typically, PCs were very heavy, square, dark, and intimidating. They were seen as machines for savvy for professionals only. And Apple, of course, had a different vision. They thought computers can be for everyone, and we want people to feel a kinship with their computer, that we want them to see it as kind of a friend. So in order to make it more friendly and approachable, they redesigned it to be rounded, light, and bright. And the result is that the personal computer felt actually personal for many people for the first time. So I also want us to look at some examples of how visual style can convey a personality in online services. For the purposes of comparison, I've chosen three competing products in the hotel and airline booking industry. Uh, I mean, before the internet, we had travel agents to do this for us. They would help us with this kind of anxiety-inducing task of figuring out how to book a, tri a trip. And a successful travel agent, when you think about what that would have looked like, they would have been friendly, calm, and competent. So let's think about what the personality is for our new online travel agents. The first set I looked at was the popular Hotels.com. And when you think about those qualities we talked about earlier, Hotels.com has a very dense interface. There's not a lot of white space. Um, they use very bright red, high contrast colors paired with a lot of black. Um, everything on this page is bolded for some reason, pretty much. <laughs> There's a lot of heavy shadows on several of the elements. I think I counted over 12 calls to actions. There's different pop-ups and ads. They've created an additional level of stress by having a countdown timer to add urgency. Um, <laughs> so like, imagine if you called your travel agent back in the day and you were like, yeah, I'm trying to put together a trip for my family, and she was like, five, four, three. <laughs> you know, that's not the kind of thing you would expect when you're in the middle of trying to do something as stressful as planning travel. So when I think about what the personality of Hotels.com would be if it had one, I think it would look a little bit like this. It'd be like this red-faced, angry man yelling at you to hurry up and book something, which isn't really what you're looking for in that moment. Again, when we look at the traits of sort of dominant versus friendly designs that we talked about earlier, Hotels.com very clearly skews heavily on the dominant side. The next site I looked at was Orbits.com. Again, it's a very crowded interface. It has a dark, heavy header. Everything on the page is bold again. And there's tons of elements with exclamation points, and all of them seem to be demanding immediate action. Most elements are contained by these sharp boxes with very heavy drop shadows. They use all caps in both their logo and their body copy. And again, there's at least 10 different calls to action on this very small screen space. So the effect is something like this. Um, and if you could visualize their personality, I think this is a little bit what it would look like. Again, when we consider the sort of personality traits of what a design could be, it skews very much on the dominant side. And as I mentioned a minute ago, if, think about if you were booking travel in the middle of a family crisis, you know, if you had to go home because something had happened. The last thing you would want is that kind of urgent, demanding, dominant style. So when we think about what that experience is like for those sites and what it could be, um, another point of comparison is Hipmunk. And for me, I, Hipmunk is like a breath of fresh air in this space. They use some bright colors, but they use them very selectively. There's tons of white space. Most of the elements have rounded edges. And the shadows are there, but they use very subtly and sparingly to give everything a sort of light, airy feel. 
Um, the site is generally low contrast, and you see here that only the most crucial, important information is bolded. They do create some level of urgency, but they do it in a positive way by highlighting how much money you can expect to save. And when we measure Hipmunk on the sort of dominant to friendly scale, it's clear that Hipmunk is aiming to communicate a very calm and friendly personality. So again, when you consider how stressful the task of planning a trip already is, Hipmunk really is there to offer some welcome relief. And this is no accident. This is a quote from their CEO in a Forbes article where they were interviewing him and saying, what is it that makes Hipmunk the best travel site on the web, as the author of the article was arguing. And he says, our main philosophy is that we really want people to spend as little time on our site as possible with the least amount of pain. And when you think about it, this shouldn't be that novel of a concept, but as we've seen in the travel industry, it really is. So I guess sort of my first challenge to you would be to consider, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the last few designs you've worked on and think about the sort of personality traits that they were expressing. Um, if your product were a person or a character, where would it fall on sort of the friendly to dominant scale? Does it have visual elements that support the kind of personality that you want to be expressing? And last but not least, always consider what the user's emotional state is and if your visual style is improving their emotional state or detracting from it. So your visual elements do say a lot about what your company's personality is, but you can take it one step further and put an actual face, a character, a personality into your website. The business benefits of using faces in web design are really well documented. Um, multiple studies and A-B tests have been done that have found that online services just convert better when they include imagery of faces. Aaron Walter actually explains why in his awesome book, Designing for Emotion. He says, as we gaze at the world, we discover ourselves looking back. This instinct is guided by our primordial desire for emotional connection with others. We are hardwired to seek emotion in human faces. And for this reason, photos of human faces in design can profoundly influence an audience. Nothing better demonstrates how much we're hardwired to seek out emotion in faces than the Twitter account Faces Picks. It features inanimate objects <laughs> um, appearing to experience very strong emotional reactions. <laughs> so that pepper is like clearly grumpy. We all see that. Uh, that sunglasses compartment is truly terrified. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we can see how we kind of search for emotion in every, everyday things. And the sort of instant recognition of a smile creates this very subconscious feeling in everyone that this is a place where I am safe, I'm welcome, uh, I can trust them. And this is why when I worked at a restaurant or a hotel or a retail shop, they always encourage us to smile and greet customers with genuine warmth. And we can actually do the same thing in our online spaces. We can help people feel welcome with a friendly face. So like Hipmunk, who we looked at earlier, has done this with their Chipmunk character. He embodies sort of the fun, jet-setting, laid-back happiness that Hipmunk wants to create for their users. He also adds these little moments of quirky cheer throughout the site. Um, he has illustrat illustrations on the marketing site and animations where he's dancing and different loading screens and things like that. They've even dressed up people in the Hipmunk costume and taken them out to like high-five people in public, which is kind of fun. Um, one of the most well-known faces of an online service is Freddy von Chimpenheimer IV. I, I want to get that right. It's important. Um, <laughs> and he's sort of the well-known face of MailChimp. And not only does he appear all throughout the product and marketing, but he's become so beloved that people have actually knit hats for their cats with his face on it. And they've even made like animated web comics about him and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, for a while, they did this cool billboard campaign that was just him smiling and winking at you. And I love seeing it around New York. Um, this is my favorite example, <laughs> maybe for obvious reasons. Uh, I'm obsessed with the owls. Um, but yeah, the, Duolingo has done a great job of creating a really fun mascot for their company. Uh, you can see him all throughout the product. He's kind of designed to represent 
friendliness, wisdom, celebration, encouragement, and multiculturalism. He's always there throughout the experience to sort of cheer you on. And he's used in the app as a way to incentivize progress as well. If, if you do a good job on one of your language lessons, you can unlock different outfits for him. So his look is meant to be very versatile and belonging to everyone, which is very representative of the spirit that Duolingo was built on. So maybe right now a lot of you are thinking, okay, well, I don't really have the time, the resources, uh, the ability to do a complete rebrand, which is fair, I wouldn't either. Um, or having a mascot really makes no sense for my like law company, <laughs> which is totally fair, I hear you on that. And in some cases, it's not appropriate. However, there are still a lot of ways that you can take advantage of the trust that a friendly face can bring to your interface. Dropbox, for example, took a really simple approach to reminding users of the humanity behind their product. Um, their goal was to create a feeling of sort of connection, remind people of the humans who are using their file sharing service. So they elevated the user avatar element within their app. So for people who don't have avatars, they created this fun little character called the face holder. And rather than having just that sort of generic grayed out silhouette of a human, which feels sort of impersonal, they've designed a simple smiling face that just kind of adds a small hint of cheer and friendliness throughout the experience. Full Story is an app that shows videos of every interaction that users have on your site. Um, if you have a product service, I recommend checking it out. We use it at my company and it's very cool. Um, and we use it to observe real people who are interacting with our product in real time. And I really love the thoughtful way that they've helped remind us as people who are looking at users of our product that those are real people. They've designed these custom little avatars of friendly, smiling faces uh, that represent each represents each person on our site. So even though we don't know what they look like, it reminds me that there's a real person behind this interaction and they feel like individuals with emotions to us. Envision does something similar. They use uh, smiling human faces throughout their product to make announcements, so it doesn't really feel annoying um, because they're using actual avatars of their employees to let me know about system maintenance or other kind of important updates. And seeing these messages tied to a real human face makes me feel less like I'm being inconvenienced and more like somebody is just speaking directly to me in kind of a thoughtful way. Another example comes from Airbnb. Um, they lighten up a moment of tension by including an adorable animated human on their 404 page. <laughs> um, so it shows a girl dropping her ice cream cone, which is kind of a pain point that we can all relate to. And it makes us smile even when we might otherwise feel annoyed because we're hitting a 404 page. So I started doing more research about emotional design and reading these books and putting this talk together um, when I joined Sprout Video as their creative director, but also their only designer. <laughs> and uh, at the time, I was so overwhelmed by the amount of very basic sort of brand marketing product design work that needed to be done that the idea of adding a component of emotional design to everything I did kind of overwhelmed me. I didn't think I had time to create a fun mascot or anything like that. But very gradually, I just began finding ways to incorporate kind of a human touch into our product. I'm not an illustrator by any means. I'm an interface designer. Um, but I started very small with this little character that I call Sprout. Sprout is this kind of emotional little video that shows up in email uh, messages, alerts, confirmation messages, things like that. Uh, here he's seen in a handful of our email templates that we recently redesigned. And he just kind of gives the product a bit of humanity, something to smile about here and there. I add new versions of Sprout whenever I have the chance or whenever a new alert message comes up that needs to be designed. And it's a very small step, but it's a good way of just kind of giving our company a small friendly face. Okay, so far we've talked about mostly visual ways to communicate to your users that they are sort of welcomed and supported and valued. But the content is obviously just as important to honoring the humanity of our users. So another good question to ask yourself when you're evaluating your site is, what does my content say about who I am? Or, put another way, 
How can we leverage our content to identify, target, and engage top innovative influencers? <laughs> Um, so I think if I had started my talk this way, like with this slide, a lot of you probably would have groaned or got up and left. And that's because this kind of talk is very alienating and confusing and completely devoid of meaning. We all know this and recognize this, but incredibly very bad jargon-filled content is everywhere on the web. It's so common that there are sites whose sole purpose now is just to make fun of bad jargon-filled content. This is a tool called Corporate Ipsum, and it's a lorem ipsum generator that creates marketing copy for bad websites. <laughs> so check that out if you need to make a bad website. Um, <laughs> this is another one called Sans Bullshit Sans. It's an editor that replaces any of the vague jargony words you type with bullshit set in Comic Sans, <laughs> just to like really twist the knife. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, if you're a designer or a developer, you might be thinking, <laughs> oh, yeah, apologies for the profanity. I didn't build this, so I just think it's funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, if you're a designer or developer, you might be thinking bad content doesn't matter that much. Uh, after all, if the style and the experience are great and the functionality is great, the product should sell itself, right? Well, as Erin Kassane points out in her awesome book, The Elements of Content Strategy, publishing content that is self-absorbed in substance or style alienates readers. You might not see the effects of narcissistic content right away, but eventually someone will come along and eat your lunch by offering the exact same thing in a user-centered way. And we know this to be true. It seems like every day there's a new service launched to compete with an old standby that uses jargon-filled narcissistic content. So again, I don't do this to pick on anybody, but in order to exemplify what a difference user-centered copy can make, we're gonna take a look at a couple sites that have different approaches to content, um, starting with Magento. I haven't used them, they're probably a great platform, but their primary content element on their homepage is a list of their offerings accompanied by some very generic imagery. So let's take a closer look at the content. I feel like these features that they are offering uh, could be used to describe almost any business-to-business -business service on the internet. The content here, uh, scale and grow your business, now and into the future. It's, it's so generic that it almost becomes meaningless. But if we compare that to one of their competitors who's more recently launched, uh, Shopify, you'll see that Shopify's content is very direct, friendly, and unique. It also really clearly explains what benefit their software offers to potential customers. Another example of the difference that content can be made can be found with customer relationship management apps uh, or CRMs. We were looking for a CRM service at Sprout Video recently and I didn't know what that was. <laughs> Our head of marketing just said, we need to find a CRM. So I started Googling around for different services to see like what that entailed exactly. And one of the top results that I hit was this page from NetSuite, which provides, quote, the industry's only integrated CRM, whatever that means. <laughs> I can't even pretend to understand the copy on NetSuite's site. It's like they filled it with copy from the corporate Lipsum generator. Um, only NetSuite's customer service software gives everyone that interfaces with the customer access to complete key customer data in real time, empowering them to better support your customers while driving upsell and cross-sell. This is how I felt when I was trying to read that. <laughs> like, what does this even mean? So, you know, if, if I'm searching to understand what a CRM does and how it can benefit my company, that has got me no further. So I had to keep looking. If you compare that with Dust.com site, for example, it helps me see right away that they are all about making customers happy. I still don't know exactly what they do, but I feel like I've got a better shot of finding out <laughs> from this very warm and friendly site. Or take a look at Intercom, which by the way is the service that we ultimately went with. They make it crystal clear what it is they offer and how and where we might use it. So another way to make your copy feel more human is just to tell people what it is that you stand for as a company. If you have a vision for how your company makes the world a better place, which hopefully you do, then you can share it with the people who come to your site. This isn't just a cheap marketing trip. 
trick. Um, having a clear purpose for why your company exists is humanizing because we all look for meaning in our work and in the tools that we choose to use it, to do it. Uh, we saw this with Airbnb's rebrand last year. Their company created a campaign around belonging wherever you go. Um, and it's just centered around that idea, helping people to belong so that no matter where you travel, you don't feel alone. Uh, Plated is in that somewhat crowded space right now of meal subscription services that deliver ingredient packages and recipes. And they've decided to differentiate themselves by creating an entire mini site that's dedicated to their support of locally sourced organic food. Um, another approach to having a company purpose statement on your site is just tell customers how much they mean to you. Um, rather than compete as just another e-commerce platform, Big Cartel has made a big statement about what they believe. And I think it's notable that they include very human imagery here as, long, as well as a hand-drawn font to kind of further that connection to real people. Squarespace has a very similar approach in their Build It Beautiful campaign. Uh, it's a simple, evocative slogan, again, portrayed in a handwritten font, and they tell us their purpose, which is to uplift and support users while remaining behind the scenes. Uh, Zen Payroll recently rebranded to a company called Gusto, and their homepage very proudly proclaims their belief in people. They've gotten entirely away from traditional marketing copy in favor of these very strong, powerful statements about how they want to make the world a better place. Their goal is, quote, to stop treating people as resources and instead see them as beating hearts, aspirations, and passions. So you don't necessarily have to come up with a grand mission statement or completely rewrite your site to use copy in sort of a delightful, humanizing way. Um, Chris Murphy and Nicholas Person have written this really fantastic tiny book about how the right microcopy can actually make a very big difference in your users' feelings about your product. The authors say, words don't always need to be pressed into service for functional needs. Sometimes they can simply be used to satisfy our emotional needs. We're emotional creatures, and bringing a smile to your user's face can make a world of difference. I feel like we see this in real world businesses all the time. Uh, this is a local coffee shop I go to pretty frequently in Brooklyn, where I live now. And uh, they always have just some funny little bit of trivia or like an interesting joke on a sign outside. And we're starting to see this more and more in online services as well. Uh, this is one example of microcopy making a difference in the Zen Payroll app. Because um, managing your financial information can be very boring and kind of a pain in the butt. So to make the process just a little bit lighter and more entertaining, they've included these little one-line daily inspirations, which update whenever you refresh the page. This didn't require hiring an illustrator or coming up with a copywriter or added designer development resources, really. It's just something simple somebody decided to implement to make the process a little bit more delightful. Microcopy can also be used just to make error states a little bit less of a pain point. Uh, this is an error message from a designer I found on Dribbble, and it's kind of a perfect example of this. Pop-ups and being asked to update an app are kind of annoying, uh, but the sad wrench combined with the text, we're not going to bore you with the details, sorry about that, to the App Store, it makes it feel much more acceptable and sort of friendly. They're speaking to us on human terms. Not to get political about it, but Hillary Clinton has a cool 404 page. Um, <laughs> the Atlantic actually did a write-up about all the candidates' 404 pages and what they say about them. Um, I think it's just nice that she has an intimate family picture combined with a pun. Um, doesn't really get much more human than that. Uh, lastly, we see microcopy and depictions of emotions coming together in this series of illustrations and captions that Eventbrite created for every error state or empty state in their app. They use very informal language like, oh snap, whoops, and hold up, which makes it seem like it's being spoken by a real person. And then they also add charm and kind of mom to these moments of distress in their application. So beyond just giving people a positive initial impression about your company's personality, uh, their emotional connection to your business is further influenced by how capable and intelligent they feel when they interact with your company. Kathy Sierra actually wrote about this on her blog, uh, Creating Passionate Users. And she asks, how long do users spend in the I suck or this product sucks zone? 
once they've crossed the suck threshold, how long does it take before they start to feel like they kick ass? She goes on to say that this transition from I suck to I rule is a big factor in how people feel about your product. Our goal should be to get people out of the I suck zone and into the I kick ass zone as fast as possible. And there are a ton of ways to help people who are, feeling your, who are using your service feel more empowered and intelligent. So I'm just gonna showcase a couple of companies that are actually doing a great job of this. The first one I wanna talk about isn't a website at all, uh, but rather a wine shop near my apartment called Vine Wine. Um, I love wine, <laughs> but before I started going to Vine, I was completely intimidated by the entire wine buying experience because I know almost nothing about it. I would typically walk into a wine store and stare in a complete daze at all the, com all the different choices. And sometimes a pretentious employee would come over and ask me in a really begrudging tone if they could help me find something. Uh, but since I had no idea what to expect from anything, I usually just picked the cheapest thing that didn't have a hideous label. That was like my wine buying principle. Um, so Vine does a couple things differently that have made me more excited about shopping for wine. Uh, one thing they do is they have this little sign out front with topics that you can bring up at a dinner party, <laughs> pulled from the day's news. Uh, often when people talk to me about current events and I'm like, oh yeah, I read something about that. I'm talking about, I read it on the sign outside of Vine. <laughs> um, but just by virtue of having walked past their store, I feel like a more cultured, well-rounded person. So I kind of make a point to walk by there a lot. But the really awesome thing they do that kind of brought me from the I suck to the I kick ass zone uh, happens in the store. Vine does something incredible that I've never really seen in another retail setting. Uh, they have these handwritten notes by employees for every single bottle of wine they sell in the store. And these notes aren't really written in fancy wine jargon either. The language is very funny and straightforward and incredibly mouthwatering. Like I end up buying more wine than I should just because the description sounds so good. Um, they don't just put these notes up and then force you to fend for yourself either. Their employees are available and friendly, but they're not pushy. They give you plenty of space to explore. You can read every handwritten note in this store if you want. And we all know that that feeling of like being hounded to make a purchase as quickly as possible, but they kind of let you get informed with very little pressure to go ahead and make a decision. And I think there's some very real lessons to be taken from that approach into online businesses. I love what sites like Stripe are doing with their sign up flow. They give people the option to either sign up or skip this step. And if you choose to skip this step, you're taken to a test ver version of the Stripe dashboard, which you can interact with as you would a full account. You can also read more about how to get started with the product and just kind of explore at your own pace. There's no pressure to join. So the combination of sort of thoughtful onboarding guides and buy at your own pace, the buy at your own pace approach, helps move you from the I suck to the I kick, kick ass zone <laughs> at a much faster pace than you would with a traditional sign up process. Duolingo, who I mentioned earlier, does something very similar with their web app. Uh, rather than being asked to create an account, the call to action is just tell us what language you're interested in learning. And once you've selected a language, you're taken through a brief tutorial that guides you with every step of the product, and then you're free to explore it as you see fit. Your progress through the tour is celebrated every step of the way, and there's plenty of hints to explain how to continue. So this means users can just completely bypass the I suck at using this tool phase and they don't have to figure out the product. They're just right in the I kick ass zone from the beginning. Um, even if you have a more traditional sign up process, again like Dropbox, you can still help people learn more about your product in a way that makes them feel awesome. Dropbox hired an amazing agency, uh, they're called Wayno, if you're curious, that created this user guide that ac is actually fun to use. And the results are really nothing short of delightful. In fact, they want a Webby for this. So I think it says something about their commitment to getting people to the I kick ass zone that they created a guide, a guide that has won design awards. So the next time you're designing something, think about how you can help people move along their path from the I suck zone to the I kick ass zone. I had to get cats in there <laughs> um, <laughs> as fast as possible. 
So the more comfortable and confident that people feel exploring and using your app, the more likely they are to become passionate users. Design can be a very powerful tool for helping people get to that place. So I'd like to end with this quote from Design for Emotion. Let's think of our designs not as a facade for interaction, but as people with whom our audience can have an inspired conversation. Products are people too. I think this is important because at the end of the day, our products are more than just interfaces. They're a means for bringing people together, whether it's connecting the people within our product or connecting us to the people that we want to be helping. So I hope this talk has left you with some practical ideas for how to bring the humanity back into your online businesses and help people feel more welcomed, supported, and valued. And hopefully you can see that it doesn't necessarily have to entail a complete redesign or extensive strategizing, but just taking small steps, you can have a more welcoming personality or put a face in your business or speak like a human. Thank you so much. Uh, this talk is on my site, so check that out. And if you have any questions, I'll be around tonight, so come find me. <laughs>